When my son PJ was in the first grade, we were reading one of the Harry Potter books before bed. After a particularly exciting part, he said to me, Mom, I wish I was Harry Potter. Now, I knew what he was thinking. I mean, how cool would that be to learn to wave a magic wand and fight the forces of evil? But in a moment of spectacularly bad parenting, I thoughtlessly replied, oh, so you wish you didn't have any parents and were being raised by your evil aunt and uncle. <laughs> I know, awful, right? Not terribly surprisingly, he was stunned and then burst into tears. As I gathered him in my arms and experienced the humbling power that comes from saying I'm sorry and the beauty and relief that comes from being forgiven, I experienced one of those terrific moments of human connection. Those moments when you really understand, when you're really understood, those are moments of true Harry Potter magic. As the CIO responsible for technology at the world's largest airline, I have come to appreciate that the relationships, the connections that we have at work are every bit as important as those we have at home and they often require more energy. So I spend a lot of time thinking about human connection in the workplace. Now that might sound ironic to you. You might think that my role as a technology professional is to limit human interaction in favor of more electronic means like emailing and texting and chatbots. But that's not the case. As technology professionals, we know that good technology, technology worth producing, actually promotes, not limits, human interaction. As a good example, Many years ago, when we all first started using Skype and FaceTime and seeing the power of those tools, those of us running airlines had one of those oh-no moments. You know, why would somebody get on an airplane when it was so easy and accessible and compelling just to video chat? Was Skype going to do to the airline industry what we saw Netflix do to Blockbuster? Well, with the benefit of hindsight, we see that that disruption didn't happen. And that's largely because there is simply no substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. The demand for air travel is still really strong because at its core, air travel is really about human connection. You know, I'd even suggest that all this seeing each other by video really just leads to a longing for the real deal. Face-to-face -face interaction creates shared experiences. And through those shared experiences, we get to know each other. That knowledge and understanding that we gain leads to connections between us, and human connection can create some really beautiful things. You know, Abraham Lincoln, when he was thinking about one of his adversaries, said, I do not like that man. I must get to know him better. You know, when I read that quote, I know I'm supposed to feel inspired, but honestly, unlike Lincoln, I probably spend more time thinking about how to avoid the people I don't like rather than how to spend more time with them. So really, the quote just makes me feel like a terrible human being. <laughs> but honestly, uh, I, deep down, I know that he's right. And I know that only by getting to know each other will we develop the understanding that we need to work together to solve problems and to innovate. So it was with the spirit of Lincoln's words and the human connection that they describe that I made the decision to move my technology organization of about 4,000 people to the open office concept. Now, I can hear the groans from a number of you. The fury that the open office concept evokes in some people is akin to robocallers at dinner time or those videos that just start playing when you go to certain websites. There's a lot of fury there. The open office detractors, let's call them the soloists, they practically froth at the mouth when they talk about how much they hate it. It's too loud, it's too crowded, I'm gonna get typhoid. One of my favorite reasons for why this impending move was going to be a disaster was people are going to ask me questions all the time. <laughs> I would generally answer, so we don't want people to ask questions? You knowledge hoarder, you. <laughs> but most importantly, they equate that word open with exposed and no privacy. The open office proponents, let's call them the harmonists, they have a real branding problem on their hands with that word open. If I were to rebrand it, and I have a modest suggestion here, how about the won't you be my neighbor office concept? Who can say anything bad about Mr. Rogers? And after all, isn't that what we're going for here, a neighborhood feel? The kind where the kids are welcome to run interchangeably between the homes and the road is closed on holidays for the neighborhood potluck? 
Look, I know the open office concept isn't perfect. There's a lot of research that suggests it can negatively impact concentration and productivity and interaction. I know all this because before we made the move, the soloists on my team would secretly leave articles citing this research on my desk. <laughs> I used to think, you know, if this were an open office, I'd know who left that. <laughs> but seriously, I agree with a lot of the research. There is no doubt that people need heads down focus time that's uninterrupted in order to get work done and to recharge. And we made sure those spaces existed when we developed our open office. But the problem with the research is that if you, there are no two buildings the same, there are no two floors the same, there are no two company cultures the same, and if you've seen one open office, you've likely just seen one open office. The research necessarily makes sweeping generalizations and conclusions that simply can't apply in all cases. What teams really need is for communication to be smooth and seamless, and there's no better way to get that than with proximity. There's actually some science behind this. It's called the Allen curve. And basically what it shows is that the closer we are in proximity, the greater the likelihood of communication. And conversely, when distance increases, even by as little as six feet, the likelihood of communication can fall to almost zero. But I think we all know this to be the case just through our own experience. I mean, how many times have you bounced an email back and forth like 10 times only to find that a two-minute face-to-face conversation resolved the issue. You know, this is called the Allen Curve because of an MIT professor who did the research that supports this conclusion, who happens to be named Professor Allen. Um, with all due respect to Professor Allen, I have to say I find that branding about as unimaginative as the open office. If I were to rebrand this, I'd call it something more like the connection curve because it's not just communication that proximity promotes, but also connection. And here's a good example. After we moved to the open office, there was a team that was meeting in one corner of the floor, and they began clapping. Clearly, something good had happened. Spontaneously, and without any knowledge of why that team was celebrating, the rest of the floor joined in on the clapping, which led to a lot of spontaneous laughter, which led to a lot of spontaneous good vibes rippling through the floor like small waves of positive energy connecting everyone in its wake. Now, pretty much every day, that beautiful clapping contagion happens for uh, no good, very good reason. I know some of you are like, see, that's why I hate the open office. <laughs> clapping and laughter, I'd be so disturbed by all the laughter. <laughs> now, let's think about that for a moment. The open office concept isn't gonna save the world but the human connection that it creates just might. My own personal experience after moving to the open office was that I learned more in one day about the guy sitting across from me than I had in the entire previous two years where we had sat in adjoining closed offices. For the first time, I had a real conversation with this guy, Andrew. Now, granted, initially the conversation went something like, hey, what happened to all the walls and doors around here? <laughs> but we progressed into more meaningful territory. And over time, we developed a connection that simply didn't exist in the world of four walls and a door. I get that we're all wired differently, and there is no one office configuration that is going to satisfy everyone. The soloists on my team will never want an open office. But perhaps what we as business leaders need is not to give people what they want, but to give people what's effective and what pleasantly coincidentally the world just happens to need more of right now, a bit more togetherness. This actually isn't a talk designed to encourage you to move to an open office or some sort of academic defense of the concept. For that, I would need a randomized controlled experiment with pretest and post-test measures of collaboration, or at least some cool pie charts. No, really, this is a talk designed to discuss the need for greater human connection in the world today and some encouragement for those of you who are soloists to be a little bit more open to being open. A recent experiment was done in which the participants were asked to engage with strangers on their morning commute, and those that did reported they were a lot happier as a result of doing that than those who hadn't. While they had some initial reservations about it, they found that connecting with other humans was surprisingly pleasant. The fact is that there is so much ugly in the world today that is simply the result of us choosing not to know one another. 
The perfect example of that are the trolls who have turned the beauty and promise of social media into a mean cesspool of bullying and hate. How easy it is to demonize a nameless, faceless entity sitting who knows where that you don't take the time to get to know. But fortunately, there's a flip side to that coin, and that is the beauty that comes from really taking the time to get to know and empathize with another human being. And a perfect example of that are Julie Bland, Francis Hernandez, and Elsa Rodriguez. These three American Airlines flight attendants showed such care and compassion to an elderly gentleman who had collapsed in the airport and had to be rushed to the hospital. The gentleman, who Julie recognized from her flight earlier that day, was in a foreign country with no family around. He spoke no English, and he was in really serious condition. How terrifying is that? For the next week, these three flight attendants treated him like they would their own father. They visited him, they provided for him, they translated for him, they advocated for him, they filled his hospital room with balloons and flowers, the physical manifestation of their human connection that was created just through their initial simple proximity to one another. This is what it means to truly care for people on life's journey. As many before me have said, there are a lot of things that are wrong with the world. But there's nothing wrong with the world that can't be fixed by what's right with the world. And human connection is one of those right things. My Harry Potter is growing up. He is now 12, and instead of PJ, he prefers to go by his full first name, which is Perry. Yes, he's rebranded himself. <laughs> I, I wonder where he gets that. He's now really into the game Dungeons and Dragons, or D&D as it's known. This game can actually teach us a lot about human connection. Not only do you play with other people, you play in the same room with them, <laughs> but you have to work collaboratively in the game to solve whatever challenge is put in your path. You use your strengths in the service of others. I will help you because in doing so, we all win. In addition to his name rebranding, his thinking has evolved in other ways. I asked him recently if he still wanted to be Harry Potter, and he said, nah, Harry needs a stick of wood to do magic. In D&D, you're just magic. Well, Perry is already old enough to know and to begin to appreciate that solving problems is more about hard work than it is about magic. But I really hope that this D&D phase instills in him a belief and an understanding that the magic of the game is human connection and problems can't be solved in isolation. Whether you're a harmonist or a soloist, sit next to me, get to know me, I'll get to know you, and through that, we will create the most genuine and powerful magic in the world today. Thank you.